So we dropped the groundhog inside the piano. And by the way, he was beginning to swell quite a bit there. We returned to the basement, out through the window, and got all through our respective homes. Now there is a time frame here you have to keep in mind. This groundhog had already been dead a couple of days. And now it was Friday evening, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And then it was time Monday, first of all, return to school. Well, the school doors opened at 8 a.m. And the students piled into Rose Grants. And you could tell there was a very definite, definite story of snow in Rose Grants High School. Our principal then was Father Hartwick. And you could see that the back of his neck was a bright red. And so he secured some students to go throughout the school and try to sniff out the source of this really bad stench. So these students were going around kind of like ferrets, kind of like uh, uh, weasels, sniffing the breeze, sniffing the cloak room, sniffing everywhere. They finally found this up right now with the dead brown dog, and it was had to be removed. Uh, a very bad thing, actually, but when you look back out at 50 years ago, it's not so bad. <laughs> Now, there was an immediate investigation. The usual suspects were rounded up. And Paul Smith and I managed to get away with it. So you can imagine when I got a call from Gina Davis Pellegrino, and she said, Rod, we want you to come to the Saints Bill. I thought Dave Moreland has finally found out who put that dead crown on. And now I'm going to have to stay up. I'm going to have to write on the blackboard 500 times. I won't put a dead crown on. But actually, it was a nice invitation to spend some time with you and share some of my life experiences. I'd like to take a minute to let you know that I graduated not only from Rosebrook, but I also graduated from the public school here in Sainsville, which was then known as Latch. Uh, Charlie Bone, a fellow student, and I were required to go to the public school to make up a subject to be in favor in order that we uh, were able to pass and graduate from Rosecrans. Charlie and I were not the best students in the West, and certainly were not the best students. What was it uh, really like back in Zanesville in the 50s? Well, if you've seen the motion picture American Graffiti, uh, this will provide you an accurate depiction and reflection of what it was like in the 50s. Really a good movie. It was produced, directed, and written by George Lucas, who also produced and directed and wrote the Star Wars trilogy. So you know it's a good movie. Get a chance, rent that movie, and you get an idea of what it was like. At that time in Zanesville, there were only three television channels anyway. They were all in Columbus. Very few people in Zanesville even had a television set. If they did, it was about this size. And had a little screen about that big. Black and white, of course. Uh, one radio station in town, that was Wiz. There were no radio stations in Cambridge. No radio stations in uh, Newark. Uh, Wiz was the only game in town. No FM stations. We didn't have something like Hairspray. Uh, didn't have Burger King. No Walmart, no calculators. No Bob Evans, no soccer. Uh, no satellites, no astronauts. No microwave ovens, no cell phones. The kind of phones we had back in those days kind of looked like a candle stick with a mouthpiece on top and a little earphone that hung on the side. And you actually held it up like this and you talked it pretty pathetic. But that's how advanced we were back 50 years ago. And we certainly didn't, certainly didn't have anybody like Ricky Martin or Britney Spears or NSYNC, which you all have heard of right now. <clears throat> we did have in Jamesville, Ohio, a hotel, a Rogie Hotel, which I know fell on bad reputation for a while here lately. I guess it's gone completely now. I worked at the Rogie Hotel one year, one summer, while I was a student here. And I was a bellhop. I had this goofy little hat with a strap. I had a jacket, it looked kind of like a drum major jacket. And one of my jobs was to operate the elevator. Now, in those days, you didn't have push button, you didn't have push button, elevator took you to your floor. 
you had to operate it manually. It was a drum-like affair on the right-hand side of my duties, and I was to deliver the guests of the Rogie Hotel to various floors. I could never quite hit the floors. My floors were always like this, or like this. And consequently, when somebody would enter my elevator, it would be half gainers, full gainers, uh, posterior over eyebrow flips into my elevator and pile of luggage. <clears throat> and conversely, when they got off the elevator, they had to either climb out of the elevator or jump out of the elevator. So, of course, I was fired almost immediately. The first time I was ever fired, the first job I ever had, lasted about two weeks. The moral of the story is, when you leave Rosecrans, you go out on this vast sea of life, and it is vast, and it's fascinating, full of joy, sadness. If you ever get fired from a job, uh, don't get depressed, because it's usually a precursor for a much better job. Uh, in Zingsville, Ohio, we paid about, uh, in those days, 10 cents per gallon of gas. 15 cents or 20 cents for a quarter of well, can you imagine that? We drove cars with names like uh, Studebaker, Oldsmobile, Hudson, Hornet, Frosley, Frosley, I don't know what that means, uh, Crosley, and Nash. Kind of sounds like the name of the One of the first Corvettes ever made was driven by a Rose Grand student. Tom Gray. His dad was a wheel right out on Chevrolet. He so got the first board that's ever made to work. And he was a definitely a big man on campus here at Rosecrans, having the only convertible possibly in the state of Ohio, maybe even the Midwest. The Zanesville Police Department was kind of a keystone cops of in those days. And this is true. I raised my hand. We had one police officer on that force whose name was Dick Tracy. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Dick Tracy's claim to fame was he took a brand new police group and uh, at a high rate of speed went down Hill Street, up over the United and into the canal with the new police group. So that was his claim to fame. Dick Tracy had a fondness for the boys at Rose Cranks High School. You can see him parked in alleyway behind bushes, 5th Street, 7th Street, or Maple Avenue, trying to catch the boys of Rosecrans in the act of practice, which we all participated in in those days. We had one uh, Rosecrans student by the name of Ed Aikelhart, who went by the moniker, the nickname of Second Gear Aikelhart. The reason being, he always drove around Sainsville only in second gear. And he would wait, his little beady eyes peering out from the windshield, hoping to catch somebody in the traffic light and try to outrun him. And I can tell you many times I tried to outrace second year Engelhart. I was never able to do that, always humiliated. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't something I was very good at. Besides, I was driving my mother's station wagon with about a 90 horsepower engine, what do you expect? How was that going to be? Boys and girls of Rose Grants had a couple of favorite meeting places in the 50s. One was Cat Sam's, which is no longer here. And the other was the Brown Cow Restaurant out of Maple Avenue, which is totally different than Might have had three businesses out there. A drugstore, I think, uh, and maybe a flower shop. Or any shopping centers, nothing like this today. And we had a favorite place called the Brown Cow Restaurant, which was a drive in We'd never heard of drive through. That concept had not even been thought of. And so we would drive out to the drive in restaurant and sit there in the parking lot. Somebody would come out with a tray with food and put it on the side of your car and sat there. That was a big deal back then. There were only four theaters in Zanesville. Uh, let's talk about some of the class of 52. First touchdown, you probably noticed if you read the paper lately was scored by a fellow student, and that was Leo D. Donatus. I think Leo graduated class of 53, but he spent some time with us in the class of 52. Uh, Jim Smith, first graduate of Rosecrans to become a priest. Barbara Starrett, first graduate of Rosecrans to become a nun. Barbara and I dated for about uh, a year steady from going to high school, and I think possibly that experience led her to become a nun. <laughs>
One is an Iranian uh, professor uh, back in probably the 40s or 50s, maybe the 60s. He's dead now. His name is Khalil Gibran. He wrote several books. The best one is called The Prophet. The Prophet, not as in profit money wise, but in profit as seen in the future. You get a chance to get that book in the library. It's about this thick, very thin, has some tremendous insights into the meaning of life. Helen Keller, in her words, and Helen Keller, one of the things that she said to subscribe to was the fact that life is either a daring adventure or nothing. So take that to heart because when you leave Rosecrans and you get out there and have a big sea, be adventurous. And remember that life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Joseph Campbell, professor, writer, who urges people to always follow their bliss and boil down, simply put, that simply means that you should do in life what you want to do, what makes you happy. Don't get into a situation where you're doing something that you're not happy in. You want to start a rock group in your garage, get permission from your parents, and that's pretty much the way you want to go. It's what makes you happy in this world that will make you perform at your peak. Uh, Dale Carnegie is an excellent book. It's been out for many years and it's been rewritten numerous times, republished. But what you find in that book is the same uh, then as, as it is now, and that is that you should be lavish in your approbation and your praise. And what that means is that if somebody that you know in school or anywhere does something positive, does something good, recognize it, compliment that person. I'm not talking about flattery here. I'm talking about genuine recognition of something your classmates or anybody you know does. Tell them about it. And before you go, know, be deep in friends and you'll be influencing people. You've got to get the book to read the whole thing. I had a favorite teacher back at Rose Friends. It was Sister Mary Jew. And Sister Mary Jew was probably my strongest critic. She could point out all of my shortcomings, of which there were many. Very strong critic, but by the same token, she was lavish in her approbation and praise. And I found myself trying to please Sister Mary Jew by going that extra step, applying myself a little bit more than I would have had I not had that kind of praise. And it was Sister Mary Jew who gave me, or got me onto the school paper, the Rosecrans Observer. And I learned to write some stories, take some pictures, and do interviews and things of that nature. And it was one uh, very fateful day in my life. So she gave me an assignment to go to WHIC in St. Paul and interview an announcer who was on stage. <clears throat> it was radio, it was in what was known as the Linda Arcade Building now, so Caddy Corner and Cat Sands, of course, were both on now. Progress marches on. So I show up at this radio station with a yellow pad and a pencil, and I'm about to do an interview. And the man's name I was to interview was Bob White. Now, I've never been to the radio station before. And I walked into the station, and I was mesmerized by it because there were all these glass studios, there were lights blinking, on air signs, uh, big control boards with uh, meters and dials. Microphones everywhere. And here's Bob Wagner sitting in the middle. And he's talking on a microphone like this to Lord knows how many people. And he's playing records. And I'm thinking, man, what a neat job. Here's a guy who's sitting there. He's playing records, he's talking to people, and he's getting a paycheck. Incredible. So I thought about that for a long time after the interview. Spent that summer before graduation at Lake Isabel. And really started thinking about uh, the broadcast business. I broached it with my parents. My father, who was very conservative, felt that I should uh, do something a little more stable, something more regional, and that was he thought maybe if I got a job in the potteries in Crooksville or Roseville, I would have made a right choice. Well, as you all know, that business is not the greatest these days. So eventually, my parents decided that they would support me. They sent me to New York City to the School of Radio and TV Company. Learned a lot there. Spent most of my time kind of looking at the skyscrapers. Golly! I was not very sharp in those days. Now, we had one man in our class, and there's a moral to this story, who collectively, we didn't think was going to go very far. He didn't have a command of the language. No inflection in his commercial delivery. No resonance in his voice, and just didn't seem to have the personality or whatever that uh, is that you have to have in the 
So we all thought this guy might be. Well, the name of that student was Gene Hackman. Now, Gene Hackman got into broadcasting, then he got into the movies. And his first movie, I think, was The French Connection. The second movie, maybe, was Poseidon. Uh, I think it's the night of this month. Gene Hackman has a movie coming out with Danny DeVito. It's called The Heist. He has another movie coming out, uh, I'm not sure the name of it, the, the 30th of this month. And he's a multi, multi millionaire and very successful guy today. Moral of the story is that no matter what your fellow classmates think of you, no matter what other people's perception are of you, you can. Write your own ticket in this world, and you can fool everybody and become a success, and you can become wealthy. Because one of these days, very soon, when you leave Rose Ranch, you're going to be faced with these things. And perhaps some of this conversation will be here today, maybe, of some value to you when you get a little bit older. Follow your lips, keep that in mind. So, following graduation from the School of Radio and TV Technique, I was hired at WHIZ in Zanesville, strangely enough. Had to be a mercy booking because I really sound bad. And I was fired three months later for a darn good reason. It all started one night when I was on the control board. It was Sunday night. And we were carrying the World Heavyweight Championship by 10 o'clock, brought to you by the Gillette Cattle Cage Company and the Gillette Safety Razor Company from NBC. Now, I'm a single then dating a lot. I'm getting a lot of sleep. I'm in the control room, and on my right hand side is Meet the Press on the tape recorder. And Meet the Press is going out over the air. Now, at the conclusion of Meet the Press, all I have to do is lean forward, open the microphone, and say, This is WHIZ Zane's Read a 30 second commercial. <coughs> and then at 10 p.m., I was to reach up and hit an NBC switch, which then brought the network in and the World Heavyweight Championship fight. Now, let me preface this with the fact that. This uh, evening was sold out. The station stood to make a lot of money. And we were the only game in town in all of this area. It was our station. We that many people stayed. So I'm sitting there, very comfortable in the chair. The press is on. And all of a sudden, I fell asleep. So the press is running away, and I'm snoring away. And all of a sudden, I woke up, and it's about 10.20. And I know I've missed a lot of this fight. I didn't do anything except reach up and hit the switch. And the World Heavyweight Championship uh, person, I think his name was Jersey Joe Volga, is uh, saying, hey, it was a great fight. I'll see you soon, Mom. A wonderful fight, even like love. Well, now we had missed the entire fight. All these commercials that we had sold are going to be canceled. There was a bunch of lights in the control room, all phones. They were all lit up. First one was a sales manager. He was unhappy. I was a world of doo doo. The second one is a program director. Maybe got a call from the owner of the station, Clay Liddy. Uh, Clay not only owned the radio station, but he owned the newspaper in town. And he questioned my the legality of my birth certificate for about an hour. And then I got a call from uh, the station manager, Alan Landis, who I think is still in the township. And he was flat stack, he was a nice guy, he could fire me right on the spot. But what he did is, he gave me 30 days notice, pretty much unheard of in those days. And I was to be out of the station in 30 days. Now, picture this, I just graduated from Rose Grants not too long before this. All of my friends knew I was on the air, I'm working at Wiz. And in 30 days, I'm going to be totally unemployed. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to end up cutting grass here. Because I don't have a job, I spent my parents' money for schooling, and uh, I was pretty depressed. Faced with a lot of pending humiliation. Now, during that 30 day period, still on the air, and I happened to hear a radio program from Hawaii, and it's called Hawaii Calls. And the announcer on that program, Buffy Edwards, would open the show each time it was on the air. And he would uh, say, I'm speaking to you from Waikiki Beach in front of the Royal White Hotel. The temperature of the water is 82 degrees. You can hear the sound of the surf, the wonderful Hawaiian music. And I thought, wow, that 
beautiful Hawaiian islands, and I'm really calm. The first assignment I got in the Hawaiian Islands on this radio station, KMBI, was play by play sports. And I'd done it before, and I didn't think I'd have any problems at all. So I got to the stadium for broadcast, and I had to count it on the main bus so I could run into it. As you all know, play-by-play -play broadcasting is extremely a fast narrative. Really, got to talk about it. And I'm running into names like Almani Kahalewa, My Boy Ino Boy Al, Seiji Fukagawa. These are the names I've got to do play-by-play -play basketball. And I can tell you, I really butchered that first program. It's a wonder I didn't uh, get a ship call back to the main. My pals in Hawaii, Filipino, Portuguese, Tibetan, Chinese, Hawaiian, mixture of their own. Major event that took place on Maui was the launch of the Russian Sputnik. And I can remember lying on the beach of the beautiful sand beaches of the UK and Maui looking up at the sky at night. And uh, you could actually see, because the atmosphere is very clear, but you could actually see the satellite coming over in a low trajectory over the way. And see the little light blinking up. Mind boggling experience. Uh, here we are, human time is in space. Of course, those days you never, never dream that we would be doing the things that we're doing today. Remember this, what you think is impossible today, you'll probably be doing it tomorrow. Some people in this room may even end up on the moon, who knows? Well, I began saving a few dollars there. I tell this next story for a reason that doesn't have to do with Zanesville. I flew to California and I bought, uh, I bought a uh, 140 MC uh, Jaguar convertible roadster. It's a very hot car in those days. I had one of the lawns in uh, France several years in a row. And eventually I left Hawaii, as I say, I'm telling this story for a reason. I shipped the car back to California and I took the job at WYMGMD as their news director for that outfit. So I shipped the car back and the first weekend I got off at WYMG, I got that Jaguar all shined up, cleaned the wire wheels and the toothbrush, I got on my Hollywood to wrap around totally happy sunglasses, and I drove back to Zanesville. Now who do you think I was looking for when I came back to Zanesville? <laughs> Second year angle march. So I could once for once maybe beat him in the race. Unfortunately, I never saw him again, and that was the end of that episode. Sometime later, at the wing in Dayton, I got a story across my desk about a woman who had been convicted of murder. She was scheduled to die in the Ohio electric chair, and she would have been the first woman to ever be executed in Ohio. This was a history making story that there was one. I talked with a couple of investigators on that case. And they told me they, while the circumstantial evidence was pretty strong, they were not convinced that she really did it. So I managed to get an interview with her at Mary Sill Reformatory in Mary Sill, Ohio. And that broadcast was carried nationally on NBC, CBS, ABC. And I called Ohio Governor then Mike DeSalle and I told him that uh, we were doing this interview. And I knew that he was a strong opponent of the death penalty. And so between the interview and Governor South, mostly the South, uh, this woman was given a new trial. And it was found out that she was not guilty. And she's a free woman today. I don't know where she is. Wish her well. But uh, a major happened. I had, uh, had a friend in the broadcast business in Dayton, Ohio. And again, everyone thought Bill Donahue just wasn't going to make it. This was no big It's kind of goofy looking, actually, in those days. Uh, wore the cheapest suits I ever saw. And uh, so everyone thought that this guy's not going to make it. Well, uh, some of you are way too young to remember Bill Donahue, but Bill Donahue ended up with a national syndicate, called it in talk show, made uh, Buco De Niro, is retired now with tons of money. And again, it doesn't matter what other people uh, you can write your own ticket in this world, and you can become a 
success. In Dayton, Ohio, uh, I had an opportunity, I would urge any of you to do this instead of chance. had an opportunity to join a group of uh, young guys and we formed Ohio's first uh, skydiving club. And it was the most terrifying experience of my life. I was absolutely total dread of ever jumping out of the airplane. But I did it anyway. And let me tell you, if anyone in this room went back to home after our little session today, walk in the house and ask Dad and Mom if they would like to join you in the parachute. You know? But it's a wonderful experience. And uh, when you become more of an adult or with parents' permission, you should try this because you will end up with a tremendous feeling of absolute visibility it lasts a long time for years, especially the more you do it. And things on the ground don't seem that important. And you're able to overcome a lot of fears that you have because you just overcame one of the biggest fears there is, and that's coming out of the airport. So try it, you may like it. Now, your principal day of plans on making a jump at Zanesville Municipal Airport this weekend. <laughs> And I need to know by your applause, how many of you here are willing to pack Mr. Moreland's parachute?
But you just don't get up some morning at home, get out of bed and go to Vietnam and have a vehicle to do it. And that vehicle presented itself shortly thereafter in the form of Senator Robert Taft Jr., who told me he was going to Vietnam. I informed Senator Taft that I was the best photographer in all of Cincinnati, probably in the Midwest, which was certainly not true. I didn't know anything about shooting films. And I told him that I would produce a one half hour film, color, sound, documentary of his journey to Vietnam which he could take back with him to Cincinnati to use in his re-election campaign to get back to the Senate from Washington, D.C. He thought it was a good idea. Then I went to the station and told the manager of the owner that Senator Taft wants me to go to Vietnam. And he thought, wow, that's a great idea. And I pointed out that we do interviews with young men and women of not only Ohio, but Indiana, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and they can sell commercials on either side of those interviews. And they said, hey, that's a great idea. And I said that you're going to have to pay probably a salary for all of my expenses. And he said, yeah, fine, we'll make money in this. <clears throat> so now here I am, I'm a one-man production company, I'm going to Vietnam, I'm going to about shooting a film. And uh, I buy a uh, Oricon camera, which is a great big heavy job, you have to sit around your shoulders, great big big here. Big sound rig. Uh, got some still cameras, some tape recorders, and I'm off to Vietnam and the Vietnam War. I flew out of Cincinnati into Hawaii, got to see some of my old friends there. Out uh, there into the Philippines, and from the Philippines into consulate air base in downtown Saigon. Now, the Vietnam War is ancient history for a lot of you, but there are certain things about the Vietnam War that are extremely unusual. And that is that it, first off, is the only war that this country ever lost. We've never lost any wars except Vietnam. Uh, and trust me, we lost that war. It's not a righteous war. Uh, when I arrived in uh, Saigon, uh, flying over the city, you can see a U.S. war material all the way to the horizon. Tanks, jet fighters, everything you can imagine. It was there. It was a monumental effort, much bigger than Desert Storm, and a whole bunch bigger than Afghanistan. So I get into a French cab or an old, and uh, I've got all this gear packed all the way around me. I'm heading to downtown Saigon from the consulate airports. And I told the cabbie to take me to the Caravelle Hotel, which I had booked. And he said, what floor are you on? I said, I'm on the fifth floor, room 507. And he said, well, you may have a problem because a couple of weeks ago, a woman visiting a correspondent there in his room left her purse under his bed full of plastic explosives. She left, the explosive went off, killed several correspondents, and took out a fair portion of the fifth floor. So I didn't even have a room to check into. I think it was kind of a dangerous place here. About that time, I see coming toward us in a tank, a U.S. Army tank, uh, coming right down the road toward us. And behind it and attached to it was concertina wire, which is that coiled stuff you see at prisons. And wired into the concertina wire are a whole bunch of Vietnam bodies. They're taking them out for burial, and they're kind of dancing along with them. So that like marionettes. Now the hair at the back of my head is standing up. And I'm this I can all kill. So long story short, I was able to get to a room at the Aspen. It was a French hotel. Everybody there spoke French, except me. And I would have to use sign language and whatever else just to get to room service. Next morning, I went down to the Magnet headquarters, got all of my certification, learned how to do. Uh, or pick up press releases and field reports and all of that. And now I'm operating in the as a reporter. I did get some instruction from ABC, their hero chief, on how to operate a 16 millimeter sound camera. And I actually did put together a half hour documentary for Senator Taft. He returned to Cincinnati. He was reelected, by the way. He's the father. He's deceased now. He's the father of the current governor of the state of Ohio object. 
Now, one thing happens to me in Vietnam, I'm going to go a bunch of war stories. And it's hard for me to talk about because Vietnam did have a pronounced effect on me. Uh, really tough. And one day, uh, I was given the permission by Marine Commander Lou Wolf to go out to the hospital ship Repose, which was anchored in the South China Sea off the coastline of Da Nang. So I'm in a chopper, and the chopper is full of wounded Americans, men and women. They're going out to the repose for treatment. I'm going out to do a report. And the chopper lands on the deck of the repose, which is a large ship, probably two or three football fields long. And I went inside this hospital ship, and it was level after level, tier after tier, room after room, of nothing but young men and women, some of them your age, <coughs> who were not just wounded, they were badly wounded. Uh, some of them had uh, one leg, uh, some with no legs, and some with no arms and legs. Parts of their bodies gone, parts of their face gone. It was uh, a hellish experience. So don't let anybody ever suggest to you that war is something that's gun ho and glamorous and uh, the like. It certainly is not. In fact, it's, it's all. And then when I flew off the repose back to today, uh, I'm surrounded by body bags of young Americans, men and women, who are never going to come home. And in fact, uh, 58,000 U.S. men and women never got to leave Vietnam, except in a body bag. And that's, I guess, pretty much the population of today's little mind. Well, after Vietnam, and eventually I did return to home, uh, it was a tough experience for me. And as I say, a lot of things that I, I saw there that uh, just uh, absolutely wreck a person. Uh, I took a year off from broadcasting, uh, got a cheap farm down in Morgan County, Ohio, near Malta. Got a couple of uh, $100 horses, did some horseback riding. And I just laid down, didn't do a thing. Took a year off just to recover from those experiences that I had in Vietnam. Now remember, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And so I got a call from some friends in Cincinnati, and they were talking about forming the Jet Travel Club. Change course in life, just don't keep doing the same thing. And I didn't know anything about Jet Travel Clubs and travel business in general. But I thought, oh hey, we'll travel. So I went into partnership with a man in Cincinnati that uh, is even cheaper than I am. And the first thing we had to do is we had to get an airplane in for us. We took over an existing travel club, built a membership to 6,000 people, big club. And we finally found the plane we could afford. It was owned by Taiwan. It was for sale. It was formerly a cafe in the city. And it was one ugly bird. I mean, it had rust, and I mean, it was a bad shape, cosmetic. Uh, mechanically, it was in great shape because we had it checked out. So we made the down payment on this plane. It sounded like we got some serious money, but trust me, we can get this plane really reasonable. And we assumed some back-breaking payments on this. Now, once we hired the crew, the pilot, uh, Ernie Dodge, uh, a co-pilot, Ernie had about 40 co-pilots, maybe 19 or 20, and uh, then we had an engineer who was pushing eight. I mean, he was old. And uh, we were down after hiring the crew, after buying the plane, and getting ready to start, we knew we had to do something with the looks of this plane. It really looked bad. Nobody was right in mind what got on this plane. And we didn't have very much money. All we had was enough to paint one side of this plane. And of course, what side did we paint? We painted the side the passengers got off. So when they would come out, it looked like a brand new plane. If anybody would have ever gone around the other side, they would have never gotten on the plane. Uh, one night, I got a call from my daughter who was on a getaway trip in the Bahama Islands. And she said, Daddy, you won't believe what happened. And I thought, oh man, a wheel fell off or something. We got 117 people. This plane held 117 people. And the Bahamas, how are we going to get back? kind of really going off. He says, no, no, nothing wrong with the plane. Well, what's wrong? She 
said the engineer died. But oh man, he says, we can't fly this plane without an engineer. And I said, well, how many people know this? She said, well, just me, the pilot, the co-pilot, and our operations guy. I said, well, where is he? Uh, he's still in his seat in the cockpit. I said, okay, well, don't tell anybody. Close the door. I'll call you back. So now I call my partner. <coughs> I explained what had happened, and we were looking at having to fly an engineer down to Bahamas, very expensive, put him up in a hotel, very expensive, and uh, then we had to make arrangements to bring the uh, engineer back. Now, for a minute, we kind of lost it because he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, we can't afford this. Here's what we'll do. He said, we will saran wrap the engineer. We'll just wrap him with saran wrap. We won't tell anybody, and we'll say when we get back, he died and we're coming back. I said, man, we can't do that. And then for a minute, and there's the moral of this story, just for a minute, I'm thinking, how can we solve this? Rubbing the chin. And I'm wondering, I wonder if somewhere in the Bahamas, I might buy an upright piano. <laughs> Students of Rosecrans, thank you so much for 